today is uh, more of what's, uh, we're, we're going to kind of bring everything together because as it, I hope somewhat obvious, a bit of what we've been looking at is a little artificial. We have to do that to get started. So we started with uh, axial loading and uh, looked at the normal stresses associated with that and then some of the shear stresses. Um, we looked at torsion, which was uh, entirely shear, if you remember. And then we put in later some bending. And that, that used most of the very type of loading that we happen to look at in statics uh, and is some of the most common of the uh, structural type loadings that we'll look at. And then we looked uh, just on Monday at the transverse shear uh, uh, loading that, uh, that uh, we can see. Now we're going to put all of these together in uh, uh, some combination and see what they all have to do with each other. Uh, before that, we have to take a, a little bit of a step. This is considered a combined loading. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, because it really only is a, a strict and particular type of loading. And that's uh, the type of stresses theme, seen in thin wall pressure vessels. This is a huge part of the mechanical uh, engineering industry. There's uh, 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 the, the government regulations that uh, need to be observed uh, in terms of thin wall pressure vessels, all built on the very type of thing we're going to look at now. Um, it, it's just immense. Uh, you can imagine what, uh, what the kind of failure if a high pressure vessel fails and the sudden release of that pressure uh, can be catastrophic, even in ways you might not anticipate. Back in Boston in the early 1900s, I, I forget exactly when, there was a, a molasses tank that was holding, uh, was, was full of molasses. Uh, the pressure due to the hydrostatic pressure of that molasses ruptured the tank and caused a flood and as embarrassing as this is as a way to die, a lot, a hundred, hundred people or so were killed in a molasses flood. Um, and I believe, if I remember, it was in January as well. So they couldn't outrun cold molasses, which is, I, I imagine, you get up to the pearly gates and you got some splaining to do, because that's just a terrible way to go. Uh, there are better ways. So we're going to look at uh, thin wall pressure vessels. So. We'll take kind of a, a look at, at a spherical cap just to get the picture going. So there's some elemental piece in this. And we're assuming that these are all high pressure vessels on the inside. So this is like a, a spherical tank. And what that high pressure on the inside causes is uh, tension in all directions. in the material that makes up the, uh, the uh, uh, pressure vessel itself. And so just trying to m give it the uh, uh, appearance of a curved surface like that, uh, we're going to see then um, the uh, uh, normal stress throughout no resistance to bending in this, and all forces are, are tangential in, in nature. So we'll be a little more specific now, and we'll start with a look at a cylindrical pressure vessel. So we've got it in cutaway. Of course it's got some kind of cap on the end. Um, High pressure vessels don't do well if you just put a flat piece over the end because, uh, as I just mentioned, there's no resistance to bending of these very thin materials 
and uh, the, the end cap would be almost entirely in bending. So it's typical that a more rounded piece is put on that, and that's exactly what you see with uh, scuba tanks and the like. So we've got uh, this uh, pressure vessel with uh, an, an associated um, coordinate system. First, though, let's make sure we understand what we mean by thin wall. We have R, the inside radius of the tank, and then there's some wall thickness, T. And it's the ratio of those two that we use to, as our definition, uh, as arbitrary as it might be. We define a thin walled pressure vessel as one where the radius to the thickness is greater than about 10. So if we had a 10 inch inside radius tank, uh, any wall thickness less than one is going to be considered a thin wall pressure vessel. All right, then uh, as we had before on the little spherical picture, we've got a little elemental piece there, and that's going to see two types of normal stresses on it. There's going to be a hoop stress that we call sigma 1. I don't know why we can't call it sigma h, but not one of the books I have looks at it as that. Um, so sigma 1 is a hoop stress. Hoop, obviously, because it goes around the uh, vessel as um, as the type of metal hoops you'd see if we, uh, we if we were looking at oak barrels and the like, uh, they have uh, exactly that type of thing, and it, it, we'd be looking at the stress. In fact, we have a couple problems in the book uh, looking at pressurized oak barrels with the metal hoops running around them, and then there's a longitudinal stress called sigma two. down the length of the, uh, of the vessel itself in its, in its main dimension R. All right, we need to take this apart and see what we can make of these stresses themselves in regards to the load they're carrying, which is the internal pressure. This internal pressure is considered a gauge pressure. You may have heard the term before, uh, gauge pressure. It's, it's, it's precisely the type of reading if you happen to have a pressure gauge and you uh, attach it to some kind of nozzle that could read the pressure in the tank. It's uh, merely the pressure over atmospheric. That's all your pressure gauge reads when you take the pressure in your tires. It's how much pressure there is in the tire in addition to the atmospheric pressure. What that allows us to do is we only need to look at the forces caused by the internal pressure. We don't need to balance that against the outside, the atmospheric pressure also pushing on the, on the pressure vessel uh, in towards the center. We can just ignore that because we subtract it off of both of them, so we only have the pressure above the atmospheric to worry about. If we consider the atmospheric pressure and use the absolute pressure on the inside of the tank, they just subtract anyway because they're exerting equal and opposite forces on either side of the wall. So we're only going to look at the gauge pressure. We'll use, uh, in a, a fit of creativity, the symbol P, and now we can look at uh, at the type of stresses that we've got there. So we'll start with a little segment of the 
of the uh, vessel down the x direction. So we'll take a, a little piece of it that runs like this. So what we've done is we've got a little piece of the tank of some length delta x and I've cut it right in half and exposed that tank. The type of thing we've done before where we're just imagining a cut through the tank to expose the internal, face, uh, internal forces in the material itself. So when we do that, we've got this internal pressure that's pushing out on the tank. Now, you have all, <coughs> bless you, you have all taken physics 2, I believe. Is that right? You looked at hydros, David, have you? Um, I did take physics 2, but I'm not okay. sure if we covered this. At uh, case, so. what, I'm, what I'm looking at is, is the hydrostatic pressure, the pressure uh, of a fluid on um, a solid surface. And in this case we have a curved surface. Now it might seem problematic at first because the pressure, pressure is a force that can act normally to a surface only. There's no uh, transverse ability of pressure to exert any forces. So the pressure is going to be acting around the surface like that, normal to the surface in every, every place. And if you remember from uh, hydrostatics in <coughs> physics 2, if you actually covered it, there was a small section, you can pull out your physics book, it'll show it, the uh, forces on submerged curved surfaces. <coughs> it may seem somewhat problematic because uh, you, you're going to need to integrate over the entire curved surface on the inside. What it turns out though to, to uh, end up in result is very, very simple. You only need to look at the projected surface and the forces normal to that. This happens because every upward component of force has an equal and opposite downward component and they all cancel. So any, any of the, let's see, this would be our y direction. Any y direction component to the forces cancel each other and the result is that you only need to look at the equivalent pressure acting on a projected area to get the total force acting uh, uh, on that curved surface. Which makes it a lot easier for us as we balance the forces because we're balancing the forces really in the z direction because of the exposed surface we've got there. So we've got this projected area which is nothing more than the rectangle there with these and my perspective on my drawings off a little bit we've got pressure the gauge pressure acting on that and that's all we need to consider and that will give us the equivalent pressure of having done it all the way around the surface, normal to the surface. We'll get the, the same <coughs> equivalence. So we've got those forces trying to push that, uh, that cylindrical, that, that uh, hemicylinder, semicylinder, the semicylinder towards uh, the minus z direction and then of course the the uh, internal forces in the material, which is what we're trying to find, are 
acting in the opposite direction to balance those because we have static equilibrium in all of our situations that we work with. Remember, this is this is in the uh, the hoop direction that I'm looking at now. So we can balance the forces on this piece here and um, see what they equal, and that'll allow us to find the stress. So the the first part, I guess, we can do is is we have this pressure acting on that. Uh, um, that area, and that area is twice the radius times de delta x. So that's 2r delta x. That's the, that's the pink pressure force exerted by the fluid. due to uh, the fluid pressure. Whether this is uh, compressed air or uh, simply uh, uh, liquid storage, liquids being so much heavier than gases, they tend to exert a lot of pressure on their own right. So that's the, the pink pressure, that's got to be balanced by the stresses in the material itself, which is uh, delta, et, uh, it's uh, uh, the stress <coughs> acting on the area of the wall that's exposed, which is delta x times t, but there's one top and bottom, so it would be 2t delta x. And that's the um, <coughs> due to uh, internal forces in the wall itself. Alright, so everybody comfortable with the picture for the most part? We're balancing the uh, Fluid pressure forces trying to push this in the minus E direction and the internal forces uh, in the wall itself as it tries to hang on to the other half of the tank that we've uh, taken out of the drawing. And so this simplifies uh, quite quickly. The delta X's cancel, the twos cancel, and we get then the, the hoop stress Sigma 1 is equal to P R over T. Units work out okay? Always check our units as we go through algebra. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Remember the so. units on stress are the very same units as pressure. In fact, we often use Pascal which is a standard unit of pressure. So it works out just fine. Um, for the units, units of pressure in Pascal. We're capitalizing A, and that stands for area. We don't capitalize units. There we go. And so that's the hoop stress. It's as simple as that. We need to know what the gauge pressure inside the tank is, and then actually multiply it by that ratio that we use to define the thin wall uh, limit itself. So it's a pretty straightforward, uh, straightforward calculation there to find the hoop stress. Alright, to find the longitudinal stress, we need to make the cut in the other direction. So, uh, it's very much like the picture we've got there, so I'll just redraw it here so it's a little bit bigger. 
kind of exaggerate the wall thickness so that we can see all the parts of it. And now we've got the same type of thing uh, on this projected area here. We have the fluid pressure acting. So that's, that's going to, the force acting over that area is the force in the, I guess what would be minus x direction. And then we have this internal wall force as the wall tries to hold itself together, acting all the way around on this exposed bit of wall that we've cut open in the imaginary way we've been doing this all along. And so again, we need the two forces to sum to zero, otherwise we won't have static equilibrium. So we have the fluid pressure acting on that projected area, which is just the inside radius, uh, inside circular area, pi r squared. So again, that's the uh, force due to the force due to the fluid. <coughs> and that must be balanced by the internal stresses in the material itself to withstand those forces as this this uh, pressure is trying to rip the tank apart, the tank's trying to hang on as best it can. So, um, due to the thin wall approximation, all we need to do to estimate this area is, uh, we'll just call it 2 pi r times t. It's not quite that, it's, uh, you know, we, the, I guess have to do 2 pi r outside minus r inside and then times t. Um, or no, our average, I guess, would be a, a better one. But this is this is close enough with the thin wall approximation, and so that's the internal wall forces. And we can then solve for the longitudinal stress. Uh, Pi cancels, and one R cancels, and we get then P over two T R. Is that right? Pi R P R. No, P P times R over two T. <coughs> Notice that that's half the hoop stress. So it's the, the uh, circular direction, the hoop direction, that's going to be the greater of the dangers of the two. So that's our longitudinal stress. straightforward. Uh, these aren't severely difficult calculations, so we'll do a couple problems just to make sure we can work. Oh no, what we have to also do is, uh, this is for a cylindrical tank, but uh, most of these tanks will have a circular end cap on them, so we have to uh, do our analysis for that. So we'll now look at a, a spherical tank. There are some tanks that are completely spherical. They're more difficult to make, but they do use less 
uh, material, as you remember from probably Calc 2 or 3, the maximum volume for the minimum material is for a spherical shape, which is why God makes water drops round, in case you were wondering. So we'll now look at a, a spherical tank. I'm guessing it's also probably one reason why Soviet space capsules are often spherical. Uh, yeah, well that's a pressurized, a thin wall pressurized vessel. Except the atmospheric uh, pressure P is equal, close to zero. Yeah, so the, kind of like that. The, uh, the, abs the gauge pressure and the internal absolute pressure are essentially equal. In this case, since it's spherical, there is no preferred direction, it's going to be symmetric in all directions, so we only need to figure out a single um, stress. Uh, hoop. There is no hoop direction, there is no longitudinal direction, so there's only this one single stress we need to figure out. Um, but we'll call it sigma 1, uh, since that is the worst case over in the cylindrical tank, so we make sure that we're looking at the right one. So if we make a, a cut through the middle to expose this, we get the same kind of picture we had before. Now we have a, a hemisphere cut open with Fluid pressure like that, and internal wall stresses like that. We get essentially the very same picture we just had, and we get the very same solution, PR over 2T. See, but you see uh, propane tanks uh, outside of summer camps all over the Adirondacks, so this very same type of thing. All right. <coughs> Tank is eight feet long. The cylindrical part has a wall thickness of <coughs> three-eighths inch and made of steel. <coughs> it's Thirty inches in diameter, and the end caps themselves are five sixteenths inch steel. Or as we'd say, five teens. We wouldn't say that, it's too embarrassing to say. We'll give it a gauge pressure of 180. PSI G. P the G means gauge. PSI gauge pressure. Uh, you might also see, you'll see this when you take thermodynamics, that there'll also be pressure readings in PSI A, which is pounds per square inch absolute. That then includes the effect of atmospheric pressure, which we don't need to do because the atmospheric pressure in uh, is subtracted off the part of the atmospheric pressure that's also in there. We just use the difference between the two. Okay, so we've got two pieces to look at. We've got the end cap to look at and see what the stresses are in there. Make sure that uh, it won't 
that exceed the steel limits. And that's the part we just came up with. There's no preferred direction to the, this symmetry of the sphere. So you can just put the pieces in and double check to make sure your unit's are all right. So that's up to you. Take a second to do that. And then in the body of the tank as well, we have uh, two types of stresses to calculate. signal on the hoop stress and the longitudinal stress. And then we can compare those against uh, stress limits in, in steel. These happen to be well under that, so I don't have to bother with that. But just check the numbers, check your units. This 30 inch is the outside diameter. So technically you need the inside radius and it's not 15. And there's going to be, uh, pressure vegetables tend to have a very large uh, factor of safety on them anyway, so if we're off by uh, a few little bits, it's going to hopefully get swallowed by the rather large uh, factor of safety. there. Pressure 180 PSI. What do you have for R? You had 14.84. What do you have? We'll get different things for R. You have 13 point something. We're all over the map. No, that's the outside diameter. Oh, minus, okay. Yeah. yeah. For the end cap, it's 15 minus 5 sixteenths. <laughs> What's that equal? Like special. <laughs> Oh, 
before you do it, Tommy. You were off in a completely different 13 something. Fourteen point six eight eight. Is that right, John? Finally. Six eight seven five. Yeah. Remember, we we don't need too many uh, significant figures on those type of things. And then the thickness itself. Five sixteenths. And then the same kind of thing, same pressure, slightly different to R and T on the tank body calculations. Now that is not PSIG because these are not fluid pressures, these are stresses that we're calculating here. There's no such thing as a gauge stress. It's not that I know of. Bill, you got that number? This time R is 14.625, and the uh, wall thickness is 3 inches, 375. And we already know all the units are okay. And then we only have to cut that in half to get the other one. Agreed? Joey, okay? No? What? You got this? Or that one? No, I got that one. But not this one? Not yet? Or not, not agree yet. with it? Not yet. Okay. But others agree with it? You're okay with the 70, 70, 20? Another real quick one. The uh, ultimate stress. No. Uh, well, it depends. Uh, if you remember when we looked at our stress strain diagrams, the yield stress is the end of the linear part. The ultimate stress is the highest it goes up to. Yeah. The the yield stress is what you're worried about in structural materials because when the load is released, you want the stress and the strain to be released too. Uh, ultimate stress would be for other materials. For example, this problem we're looking at is that of a basketball. And you never use a basketball uninflated. Well, sometimes you have to because you can't find the needle that you lost when your dad told you to put it away where you were supposed to and you didn't. So you can't find the needle, even though every household has 12 of them. Nobody knows where one of them is. Not that I'm speaking from practice on my own. Uh, the, uh, the ultimate stress for rubber is about 2,000 PSI. We don't need to worry about the yield stress because we're not going to pump up a basketball, then unpump it and use it. We're going to pump it up, and you want to make sure that uh, It'll take as much pressure as you can put into it and not burst. So typical uh, outside diameter for a basketball, about 9.5 inches. Wall thickness of the rubber, 
about an eighth of an inch. And typical gauge pressure is about nine PSI. So determine uh, about how much margin of safety there is to that uh, ultimate pressure for the rubber. And will you let your kids play with a basketball when it might be on the verge of exploding, taking out his eye, suing the school district for millions of dollars, and you drive nice cars for the rest of your life? I won't let kids play with us like that's pretty much Dodge Parent. Oh, well, that's just that's that's more of a, a uh, an issue for uh, so hard self esteem. Red one. Yeah. So, those those are self esteem the, issues. Uh, saucing yeah. over mediocrity. Well, it's in dodgeball when you get hit, you have to go line up on the side so everybody knows you're out, and then you're not playing. Everybody plays in America. <laughs> Come on, you got kids. You guys are kids. You grew up in that world. You guys are all in the depression that you can do anything you want. The adults in the room, huh, me, know better. All right, so figure out if we've got a, a pretty good margin on this. So we probably good at See how many basketballs you can blow up. Saturday afternoon. Well, that's, at? See, <laughs> yeah, I think the, the Mex Club should uh, should do some MythBuster type things. You know, do do tests like that, and see what will happen. Joey, I'll sign up. You will get a case of beer. Yeah, just what I want to do with eighteen-year-old students. Thanks a lot. <laughs> what's what's the U L T? All right, now you should be getting an internal pressure or uh, uh, internal stress. You're looking for the stresses in the wall of the uh, basketball. And I notice everybody's getting, oh yeah, okay. I was reading the wrong number. We're all getting about the same number. What a factor of safety, 12. Give or take a little bit. Yeah, you should be getting uh, all the units work out okay. We're at a nine psig. The radius, uh, I think, comes out to be four point six two five. And the inside wall thickness, point, oh, that was given, 0.125. And so we get a, a uh, stress in the wall material itself, in the rubber of the basketball, of well under the expected breaking stress. And so it's not common to find uh, basketballs that will rupture uh, on the playground. Okay, I think we'll do one more real quick just to give a different illustration of the type of thing that will happen. Um, so let's look at a storage tank. Now in this case, uh, the entire tank is not under pressure because it's only the hydrostatic pressure of the fluid in the tank itself. So you're not going to need a spherical end cap on the top of this because that's not uh, uh, significantly under pressure. It's the bottom down here that's going to see the greater pressure since the pressure varies with depth in the tank. So we'll give it an eight meter outside diameter, a 16 meter height, but
but the uh, we don't need that 16 meter. We'll just use 15.5 meters of fluid. That's what matters. It's the height of the fluid. Unless it is a closed tank and the uh, space above it is pressurized, which could happen if they're uh, worrying about, uh, you know, you want the tank to empty quicker, you pressurize the tank to force it out faster. So a wall thickness of 16 millimeters at the bottom. Determine at the bottom what the uh, hoop stress is then. And we know the longitudinal stress is half that. So the one thing you'll need is the density of water, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So we'll see if you remember how to determine the pressure at the bottom of a column, of a, the bottom of a liquid column. And we're assuming the top is open, so it's open to atmospheric, so this would be the gauge pressure at the bottom. Let's see who remembers how to figure out the pressure at the bottom of the fluid column. Did you guys do some hydrostatics and fluids in, in physics too? I guess that we didn't do that at RIT. You didn't? Yeah, that may, maybe, I'm wondering depending how. upon the sequence, some schools put that in, in Physics 3 and put other stuff in Physics 2. I don't think we probably would have done it as a state, because Physics 3 at RIT was a lot like Physics oh, 3 here, and we did electrical stuff. This so yeah. one atmosphere for 10 meters. So, yeah. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, I guess it would be. Pressure at depth is a function of the density, actually the specific weight, and the uh, height of the fluid column. The top. You can do without the conversion if you just use rho gh, where rho is the density of the fluid, g is the gravitational field strength, so that together is the specific weight where uh, density is actually specific mass and then uh, H is the, the height of the fluid column which is the 15.5. So if you do that then you're not in units of atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is about 14 Point seven psi, if I remember. What is that Pascal? It's about fifty thousand. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. I I try my best not to memorize conversion factors because then when you get them wrong, you don't know it. So you look them up each time, and then you know they're right. Plus, my memory sucks. If my memory sucks, I'll be a medical doctor. I'll be driving a Porsche with a blonde by my side, not you guys. And that'd be life. Um, so it's not like much point. punishment for having poor memory. That's not. <laughs> Wait till you're 57. A Porsche and a blonde sound pretty nice. Good thing my wife doesn't watch these videos. She gave up on those long ago. Figure out the pressure, rho GH. At the bottom. At the bottom, because. The pressure is much greater at the bottom. In fact, the gauge pressure, gauge pressure right at the top, is zero because it's atmospheric pressure at the top. There's no fluid weighing it down. And then once you find that pressure, you can uh, just figure out the little, uh, uh, yeah, figure out the radius thickness is given.
other than that, you do have some units to worry about. We've got some meters and some millimeters in there, but that's pretty minor. So that will give us newtons per cubic meter, whatever that means. I guess that, yeah, that's the specific weight. And then times the 15.5 meters. So that'll give us newtons per square meter or pascal. gauge pressure because you're only worrying about the fluid column weight itself above that next spot. So that, and there is no designation like KPAG, at least none that I've ever seen where it'd be kilopascals gauge. Um, I just saw one. So we've got all the numbers there. I hope you do, uh, at least. Then we've got the 152 times 10 to the 3 pascals, Newton per square meter, so the units will all work out. The radius, 3.984, right? Remember, that's the inside radius. That's the outside radius that's given there. So have to subtract the 16 millimeters off of that. And then the wall thickness was just uh, 16 millimeters. So you get, what, 37.9 megapascals? And then you can check that against the yield stress. Since this is something that needs to work both uh, stressed and unstressed, because the tank's empty and full at different times, then you probably want to design for the yield stress rather than the ultimate stress like we would with the basketball. Okay. Take our next step into, remember what we're looking at is a combined loading. So far, we've got uh, normal or axial stresses that we've looked at. That, uh, that we came up with very early, and it's the same type of thing we we're looking at here. Let me not use a P there, because that looks too much like the pressure. Um, it's a force over some unit area. We also just added bending stresses. And that was, if you remember, due to whatever the bending moment was. They were a maximum at the farthest away piece of the material with respect to the neutral axis over the uh, moment of inertia of the cross section. We also had in here shear stresses. First was caused by torsion. Which was the applied torque times the uh, uh, radius of the piece over the polar moment of inertia. And then we just had the uh, transverse shear stresses that we just added 
that's the V cube over I T. So we over the term put together those four types of stresses. Two normal stresses, two shear stresses. Now we're going to look at the possibility of loading such that these things will be combined. For example, we could have a beam that was loaded in this fashion. Simply supported, in fact, as simply as it could possibly be, just too many supports. And then some kind of load in here. Uh, what we typically look at is some kind of load like this. So we'll put 3.6 kilonewtons there. And that will be it. This will be 375 millimeters. We'll put 1175 mil. No, sorry, 1125 millimeters over there. Nothing new there. But remember, what we started the term with was axial loading. So let's go ahead and throw that in too. We have not before looked at these two things in combination. Turns out it's very, very, uh, very easy to handle. What we get here is, uh, well, the axial loading that we started with, which is just simply this 25 kilonewtons. This one happens to be in tension. This is the stuff we were doing the first week when we added on this kind of thing. Um, oh, I'll give you a cross-sectional uh, shape and area of the beam of 50 by 75 millimeters. So simple rectangular shape. And so we figured out back in the first week that the normal stress was the load being carried by a particular cross-sectional area. And we've got all this for this axial load, 25 kilonewtons being held by uh, 55 by 75 square millimeter area. And that comes out to be 6.75 kilopascals in tension, and we have to pay very close attention to whether we're talking about tensile or compressive forces now. Because in addition to that, we also have this bending that we figured out uh, just a few weeks ago. Just before break, we were looking at the bending. And you can figure it out for yourself, but this leaves a maximum moment of, well, we can figure it out, I guess. Yeah, the maximum, maximum moment comes just, just before here, and you could you could prove that to yourselves with a quick uh, shear moment diagram if you want. Um, comes out to be well, it's the the reaction here, which is two point two point seven is the reaction on that side. So it's that times the moment arm by the time it gets all the way over there, 
which is the full 375. Remember the maximum moment occurs right at the where that load is. Uh, I don't happen to have that number. Because what we really need then is the stress that that maximum moment causes. What is that moment, John? C is half of the 75 millimeter height, which is 37.5 millimeters, 0.375 meters. And what's I for a rectangular cross section, do you remember? One twelve BH cubed. Now that's just the bending stress, remember. That comes out to be uh, 21.6 megapascals. Because here's the deal with what's going on. We've got this beam due to uh, under the axial loading, let me label this the bending. We've got the axial loading that puts a stress profile that looks something like this. Uh, it's in tension all across the beam and it's, well we're looking at the average so it's uniform. And that's the 6.75 kilopascals. That's just the axial effect alone. We have to add to it this bending effect that we've got. Which looks like this. We know that it's linearly distributed about the neutral axis. In this case, the neutral axis is right down the center. And because of the type of bending we've got, we've got compression in the top of the beam and tension in the bottom. What we figured out here, remember, was the maximum stress. Now those two effects are happening at the same time on this beam, so we need to add those together to get the real effect of the stress on the beam due to the combined loading. So that's going to look something like this. Uh, on the top of the beam, we have tension stresses combining with compressing stresses, so they're going to cancel each other to some measure. Um, we have 6.75 stress and tension on the top half of the beam, 
and subtracting from a maximum of 21.6 on the bottom of the beam, so it's going to look something like, oh, I don't have to have that number. What's, uh, what's 6.75 minus 21.6? 15 something. 6.75 in tension and a maximum of 21.6 in compression on the top. What? So this is, we have at the top of the beam, we have a compression of 14 point who? 8.5. We'll call it 14.9 uh, kilopascals. So we're essentially subtracting, well, adding these two, uh, one constant, one linearly distributed, so we get a linear distribution of something like this. At the bottom of the beam, we're adding the 6.75 in tension with the 21.6 in tension at the bottom of the beam. So that should be 28.3. What? I think we think the arrow's in the wrong direction. No, one of them's in the APA. Well, uh, depends on how you draw this. This this I show going in as compression wood. It's going from outside the solid inside, so that's compression. It's an MPA. Megapascal. Oh, megapascal. No, but the other one's in KK, so it's, the difference is like nothing. Which one's which? 21.6 is megapascal. Isn't this as well? No, that's gonna. I have, I have, I have, this is actually megapascals. And I happen to write kilopascals. Okay. This is megapascals? Yeah, so we're still, we're still adding them. Let's fix that. Kilopascals there. And I hadn't written down the other one. So this is megapascals. All right, and so that's megapascals there as well. All right, but we have a lot less of it in a lot less compression and a lot more of it in a lot more tension. And notice that the neutral axis has shifted too because of this combined load now. And so now our maximum normal stress is this 28.3 at the bottom, which uh, neither one of them approached independently. But it's as simple as that, as simple as adding the stresses together. Nothing more than a, uh, a superposition of the, the stresses that we're calculating. So I'll set up a problem, we'll get started and we'll finish it very quickly on um, Monday. So imagine we have a bracket fastened to a wall here. Bolted through. And there's some kind of uh, some kind of, I don't know what it would be called uh, some kind of thing over there to which we attach a 250 pound load, and this uh, slope there is. Three by four. So some of the other dimensions. That dimension there is one and a quarter. That's from the bottom up to the top part of the bracket because we want to look at the stresses in the bracket at two places. We 
want to look at it in one place right here and one place right below that. So one place in the middle we'll call A and one place right at the bottom that we'll call B. So it's a, a, an effect where we're uh, looking at one place up here in the middle to see what the stress is and we're also looking at one place at the bottom. So up to that middle piece, it's uh, one and a quarter. It's two inches from the load over to those places. And the uh, cross section of the, the piece looks like this. It's a half an inch high and three quarters of an inch deep. So we're looking at the half inch uh, cross section there. So what we're going to get is some axial force due to the horizontal component of this that's trying to pull this bracket uh, in an x direction, if you will. Then we also have some bending component due to both of those components. Both the horizontal component is trying to bend it one way, the vertical component is trying to bend it the other way. Whichever one of those is dominant tells us which direction the bending is there but we need to add that stress to the uh, uh, to the actual stress that we're also feeling. So let me give you some of the things just to help you through this. What we call the section properties, which are those pieces of the geometry that we will need for the calculation of each of these. Uh, we'll need the cross-sectional area, of course. That's uh, 0.375 inches squared. We also need the moment of inertia, the 1 12th bh cubed, because it's a nice rectangular cross-section. That's 0, 0, 007825. inches to the fourth, <coughs> zero, zero, seven, eight, one, two, five, yeah. And then there's also shear going on for both of these. So we're going to need Q, and we're going to need it from both points. Now, if you look at the cross section, the neutral axis, of course, is right through the center. And so the Q for point A, which is right in the middle, is this entire area above there. And you calculate this and double check it. Remember, it's just Y bar A is 0, 2, 3, 4, 3, 7, 5. 0, 2, 3, 4, 3, 7, 5. We'll carry a lot of... Um, significant figures through till the end just because of some of these numbers are very very small but you need some of the detail until the end now QB is a little bit different remember B is at the very bottom of the piece so what is Q for that remember this Q is based upon the area beyond the point of interest away from the neutral axis. And there is no area beyond the neutral axis. We are at the extreme point, so that is zero for point B, because it is on the outermost bit of material. Don't think that we always do the area above the neutral axis, because that implies that this has something to do with gravity itself, which it doesn't. 
It has to do with where the forces are and where the points of interest are that we're uh, concerned with. So we'll have axial stress combined with the bending stress, and then we'll also have uh, shear due to the, uh, the transverse component of the shear on either point. So we'll finish that up on, uh, on uh, Monday, and since we're out of time.